start the recorder just so that I don't forget to do it later. The audio is good. The screen is being captured. Uh, so this is this is the grade distribution for exam two. I just finished grading every single one, and so I can collect the statistics. Um, and this is the actual curve. Okay, let me get the curve over here. So this is the actual curve. I used the fifth highest score as the new 100%. Um, so all what you see here are adjusted already. So technically, to pass the class or to pass this particular exam, uh, this is where the passing, quote unquote, passing grade is, you know, which is 1.5 out of four. So you can see that about, yeah, I would say a little more than half of the class, you know, quote unquote, passed this particular exam, which is about normal, you know, over you know the past semester. So this is usually the one of the harder exams. Um, and because it's already normalized using the fifth highest score, so that's uh, you know pretty much the way it is going to be recorded in the gradebook. Um, oh right, so I want to send you guys also the <clears throat> a sample of the exam, the final exam, so you have a little bit of time to kind of look over it so that you can get familiarized with at least you know the format. So that's what I'll do right now. <clears throat> so I'm just going to call this a sample. See attached. And Uh, fx000 dot pdf. There we go. So what you see is a PDF. You know, you just read through the PDF, and that's kind of <clears throat> the exam from last semester. All right. So what we are going to do today is a continuation of the discussion of structures and arrays, um, and today we'll kind of use a sample program to illustrate you know, those concepts. Um, at the end of today, I will probably give you a lab and a homework assignment. So that kind of depends on how far I can go. <clears throat> so let's see. Let me go here. So structures and pointers, that's usually the last homework assignment. So this is the lab and this is the actual submission. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to use a sample program to illustrate the concepts that you need to understand to kind of get this one started. And doing this homework assignment is really ultimately studying for the exam because you're going to have to use and understand all the concepts that are going to be tested in the exam. All right. so. Let's go ahead and use a command line interface to kind of, okay, let me get rid of all that stuff here. It's just a little <clears throat> distracting. All right, so I'm going to use a linked list your program as an example. Um, this is typically an, uh, a concept that people use in CISP 430. But in this class, I'm not asking you to write the code. I'm asking you to translate the code into assembly language. So the nature is a little bit different compared to CISP 430, where you have to come up with a code given the concept. So on one side, we have the usual C code, okay? And then on the other side, we have the assembly codes. So we're gonna leave the assembly code one empty until we are done talking about the C code. So this time we have a structure that I would typically call a node. And inside the node, we are going to have a struct node pointer to the next item. And then we also have an int u int 8 underscore t, which I'll just call the value. So that's, now at this point, okay, some of you probably will be asking, can we really do this? Can we refer to struct node while it is being constructed? So if you have that question in your mind, 
that's good. Okay, that's a good sign because you are looking at this and go like, we, we, are, we are not quite done with here defining struct node. How can we reference struct node within struct node itself? Well, then let me ask you a question. How big is a pointer in a 64-bit architecture? So how big is a pointer that points to a character? How big is a pointer that points to an integer? And how big is a pointer that points to a struct node? They're all 64 bits. So that means I don't really need to know how big a struct node is because next is not a struct node. It is a pointer to a struct node, which is always 64 bits when we have a 64-bit architecture. In the case of TTP, you know, every pointer is only a bit wide because we only have 256 locations in RAM. So that means the size of a pointer, regardless of what it points to, is always the same. And therefore, I don't have a problem figuring out you know, exactly how many bytes a node is requiring. So in this case, if you want to be frugal, it's going to take uh, 64 bits, which is 8 bytes, plus the one byte that we use for the value. So 9 bytes is the absolute minimum that you need for a node structure. Is that making any sense? All right. So now we're going to take a look at a global variable that is also initialized. So this time I'm going to try something that even I do not know whether that works or not. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look. So we are going to define an array of struct nodes. Okay, so we'll say uh, this is a global variable that I call array. And to initialize an array, you can do something like this. So now inside the curly braces, I can now define, so each one of these is defining a particular node. And inside each node, I just have to reference, um, I cannot name the member of the structure. It is all going to be by ordering. In other words, the first item is always referencing, or it is a value for the first member. The second item is always a value for the second member, and so on. So what I do not know is whether I can do something like this. So I don't know whether I can say, you know, uh, the address of array one, and then the value is, I don't know, let's give it a six. <clears throat> On the second item, we'll say this is referencing the uh, address of array two, which is the third item in the array, and it has a value of, I don't know, let's give it a nine. And then this one, I'll give it a no pointer, and then the value that we are going to give it is, uh, let's say, a 2, okay? So this syntax, I'm not sure whether it is going to work or not. So we are going to test it first. All right, so I have you know, written the program, and you know, let's go ahead and test the program and see whether it, it, would even assemble, uh, it would even compile. It should be able to, to compile because you know, the referencing of a particular element in the array that is being defined can, can be backfilled. So it depends on whether this is allowed in the compiler or not. So I'm going to use another window to give it a try. So let's go to tempoder gcc dash c dash uh, dash c is fine. It's, I'm just testing it to see whether it compiles. So this is l list. Oh, where did I put it? Oh, I haven't saved it yet. There we go lists.c, yep, it compiles just fine. All right. So now, in the main program, I am going to write a loop. This is not recursive, although you know, it can be done recursively. So we'll do it without recursion first, OK? If this works, and then we're going to do it with recursion, OK? This is non-recursive. So what we have in main is a local variable, which is of the type struct node um, p. So p is a pointer to a struct node. And we have an unsigned a bit integer that we call sum. The first thing we do is sum is initialized to 0. And then we have a loop. Then we initialize p to be the first, um, uh, the first element of the array. So this is going to be the address of array back at 0. And then we say while p is non-empty, or while p is not null, do the following. 
So if P is not null, that means P is pointing to a structure, which also means you know, that structure has a value for me to add to the sum. So sum is going to be, um, I'm going to add whatever the value is of the structure that P is pointing to, to the local variable sum. And then we are going to advance to the next item. So this is the one that looks kind of funky. P gets P points to next. In other words, I take the next member, the member next, okay, the, the member named next of the structure that P is currently pointing to and say, this is a pointer. Is this a pointer to a struct node? Hey, variable P, why don't you change yourself to that value? Is that okay? Okay, so it looks a little mysterious, right? Um, the point about you know, assignment statements is for something that looks like this, what you need to do is to mechanically separate the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Even though they may look related, think of it as two independent processes. You figure out the right-hand side first. What is the right-hand side? The right-hand side is referring to the member called next of the structure that P is pointing to. Do we know how to do that? I think we should, okay, at this point, but I'm gonna illustrate it too. So now we have the right-hand side value, and then what do we do? We look at the left-hand side. The left-hand side should be a variable or something that can be updated. So we are just taking the right-hand side value and update the left-hand side, done. So even though it looks really confusing, once you separate the left-hand side and the right-hand side and take it as two independent steps, then th that confusion should go away. Yes, go ahead. Um, it is, this is referencing the second element because bracket one reference the second item, bracket two reference the third item. The third item does not reference anyone else because it is the last one. What is the first? Uh, the first one is simply used over here to start the whole process of adding all the values. So with something like this, okay, the first thing is to write, run the program in GDB so that we have a better understanding of, okay, what exactly is going on here, right? So we will have, we, we're gonna do that. So first thing, let me remember to save the file because that's my favorite thing is not to save the file and then try to compile that. All right, so the program compiled just fine, GDB L list. Okay, let's do a list and let's put a breakpoint on 20, okay, which is the first line of the entire program. And one thing we also want to do is to say, okay, we have to run the program first, otherwise we cannot print anything. Okay, now that we are running the program and it has stopped on line 20, we can now ask, show me what is in the array. Print array. So this is what is in array. Um, you can see that it's using the same notation as the initializing mechanism. So the entire array is the outer curly brace and then each item in the array, each element of the array has its own open curly brace and close curly brace. Within that pair of braces, then we have the member followed by the value of the member and then the, the name of the next member and the value of the next member and so on. Do we have any questions about how to read um, how array is quote unquote printed in GDB? Yes. Well, that's the way I initialized it, yes. It doesn't have to be that way, but I did initialize it like that. So when you look at the next, this one you know, points to this location, which according to this is kind of confusing because it says it's array plus 16, or one zero in hexadecimal. Um, and then this one is kind of the same thing, except it is array plus 32, which is um, you know, two zero. And then the last one has a null pointer for next. 
So the next thing I'm going to do, no pun intended, is to say, okay, tell me where is the first element in array? And then tell me where is the second element of the array? And then what is the last element of the array? What do you notice? There should be a few things that you would notice. Yes? Not 16, 16 byte actually, yeah. Two zero, huh, sorry? One, one zero byte, sorry, it's one zero, 16 bytes. Yep, okay. But one thing we do notice is when we ask GDB to print the address of the second element, it is exactly the same as the value of the member next of the first element in the array. Is that okay? All right, so this is also helpful, you know, if I use a, a diagram. Okay, so if I use a diagram, okay, and, you know, this is high memory space, this is low memory space, I have three items in this array, okay? So there are three items in this array. This is the first item, this is the second item, this is the third item. Is that okay? The first member is next. The second item is value, next value, next value. Is that okay? So the way it is initialized is the next of the first item points to the beginning of the second item. The next of the second item points to the beginning of the third item, but the third item does not point to anyone else because it is the last item. Is that okay? So does this picture combined with what we see in GDB, combined with the program itself, illustrate you know, how things are organized? Yep. Is the size of each member of the array 16 bytes? So you, be, you might be thinking, why is it 16 bytes and not nine? Because nine would make sense, because every address is 64 bits, 64 bits is eight bytes, and then plus the value, which only takes up one byte, so that should be nine byte. The reason why it's taking up 16 bytes has to do with, we want things to line up at 64 bit or eight byte boundaries in an array, okay? So if you are to ask, okay, so let me see, print size of, struct node, it is 16 bytes. Because it wants to line up everything so that we, um, when we try to access items in the array, we don't need two different memory access to get to one thing. Because if you have an A bit thing, which is the address, that is sitting between the boundary of two A bit boundary, um, then we need two memory accesses in order to get all eight bytes. Because natively, the computer has a natural bit width. In other words, when the processor asks, hey, RAM, can you give, me, uh, the give me the content at that location, it always come back as 64-bit, okay? We can imagine the 64-bit, it's actually more than that. So when you have an address that is sitting between the sitting across the boundary of an eight byte boundary, then you have two halves. Then each one needs one memory access. So it's, it slows down the, uh, you know, the process significantly. Is that okay so far? Okay, sort of. <clears throat> All right. All right, so do we have any questions about this program up to this point? You can refer to the whiteboard. You know, the whiteboard is a kind of more graphical representation of this. But you know, the output of GDB is representing the same thing. It's just not you know, as visual. Where do you think array is? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. 
I showed it here, right? Yeah, when I print, right, what is the address of array zero? That is the, because of the way it is initialized. Because when we initialize array, we never reference array one, uh, excuse me, array zero. Yeah, but we never, but it's not a value in the array itself. When you say print array, it will print you, it will print what is in the array. But the address of array bracket zero was never a part of the content of the array. And that's why it's not printed here. When I ask for it explicitly, it prints it. Now, there's one more question. Where do you think array itself is? If I were to ask about this question, regardless of the type, what do you think is the address of the entire array? Yes? Same as the array of the array. Exactly. So it would be the same as the address of array zero because the first element of the array is at the very beginning of the array itself. This is why indexing is zero oriented because I'm pretty sure many of you have been asking that question. It's like, why are computer scientists so dumb? They start counting from zero, and when everybody else count from one, this is why. Because index zero, the first element, is right at the beginning of the entire array. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so once again, you know, it is the same. So when I ask about the address of the first element of the array, it is exactly the same location as the array itself. Now the types are different, right? Because you know, the first item of the array, the first element of the array is a struct node. But the array itself, the address of the entire array, is the address of an array of three struct nodes. So that's why the types are different when I ask about the address of uh, array bracket zero, this is the type. When I ask about the address of array by itself, this is the type. So the types are different, but the location is the same. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> All right, so with this done, we can now do a single step into the program. Uh, we are currently about to execute the first line, which is on line 20. Some get zero, okay, single step, not very exciting. Um, line 21 says, you know, okay, let's get the address of the first element of the array, which we have already figured out, which is this one here, and put it into P as a local variable. Okay, done. And this one says, you know, as long as P is not a null pointer, keep going. Okay, we're keeping, we, we keep going because P is definitely not empty at this point. So now we have to ask, what are we adding to sum? Well, you can always do this, okay? But it doesn't tell you what is at, what is the structure that P is pointing to. Now we can see that what is, what is in the structure that P is pointing to. It has a value of six. So that means we are adding six to the local variable sum. So sum should go from zero to six. Okay, single step, print sum, and it is indeed six, okay? Not surprising. So now we are ready to execute the statement that looks probably the most confusing out of this entire program. Once again, the trick to understand this particular statement is to evaluate the right-hand side and the left-hand side independently so that you don't go like, okay, so, are we getting an infinite loop here? Nope, there's no infinite loop whatsoever. We evaluate the right-hand side first. What is, the, what is the value of the member called next of the structure that P is pointing to? Well, we haven't really changed P just yet, okay? So that means whatever this thing is, is going to be used to change P. So we'll single step, and then we ask, hey, what is P now? You can go, you can see that, oh, okay, these two are exactly the same because we are using the member next of the structure that was previously pointed to by P in order to update P. Do we have any questions at this point about the C code? 
We are not concerned about implementation in assembly code until we are fully understanding what the C code is doing. So are we good so far? Okay. So now we are, so P is not uh, null because you know, P, this is, this is, okay, this value is definitely not a zero, okay? So that means, you know, the condition of the while loop is still true. So we have, you know, a few things to do, two things, you know, to be specific. specific. So now we ask, okay, what is the structure that P is pointing to? It has a nine as the value and then blah, 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 four, zero as next. So we are adding nine to six, which means uh, sum should be 15 at this point. Okay, there it is. And then we single step. So now P should be pointing to the third element of the entire array. So let's double check. Okay, this is it. And this is the third element. Okay, I need the address of. This is the address of the third element of the array. And they are indeed the same. So now we single step, okay, and we say, okay, what are we adding to sum this time? We're adding two. Um, sum is 15, so when you add two to it, it should be 15, I mean 17. So sum should be 17 right now, and it is. And this time, what is the structure that P is pointing to? Oh, we saw that a little bit early already. So this time, the member next of the structure that P is currently pointing to is a zero. In other words, it is called a null pointer. A null pointer is basically just pointing to location zero. Um, typically, it is a flag to indicate that um, it's not pointing to anything that you should dereference, okay? That is the whole point of having a null pointer is to kind of say, don't dereference this one, okay? That location should not be dereferenced. So when we single step, we get back to the, the top part of the loop. And this time when we say, okay, what is P? Is it no? <clears throat> it is no. So that means you know, this should terminate the loop and then continue with the return zero. And at this point, you know, the only local variable that matters to us is sum, which is adding all the values of everything along that chain, which is 17 in this case. All right, so that's, that concludes the execution of the C code. So I want to see if there are any questions related to the C code. Absolutely. So I can switch back to the editor, which still has the code. There you go. Everything that is relevant is in, is in view. Yeah, go ahead. Say that one more time. In the loop, okay. Uh huh. Okay, which line in the C code are we referencing? Eleven. So 11 is the initialization part of array, and this is the name of the array that we are defining. So, okay, I probably should have called it something else, but the array has a name of array. Bracket one means we are referencing the second item, and then we are taking the address of that. Is that okay? And if I, if I, think, you know, the compiler, if I think about the compiler correctly, you can even reference things that are not in the array. The compiler can care less. Because as long as it can calculate the, uh, where it is supposed to be at, it will go like, okay, fine, not a problem. So I can reference the array bracket 10, which does not exist in this case, and the compiler would not catch it. It would go like, sure, if you want to know if there was a 11th element of this array and you want to know where it is, this is where it would have been. But is there actually 11 elements in the array? No. So that can lead to some really horrendous you know, behavior of this kind of program.
you can, this is the only way to reference you know, the address of another uh, element of the array. Yeah. So unfortunately, in C code, there's no there are no other ways to reference the next item because the only name you can use is the name of the array itself. So everything has to be referencing array, which means you know you have to say. So which element of the array are we referring to when you try to get the address of that? All right, so are we okay at this point? All right. So this is basically, you know, using only concepts that you have learned in CISP 360. And you can see that there are ways to combine those concepts that you have learned already in CISP 360 that is kind of like, whoa, okay, I haven't seen this before. Well, there, there are probably many things I haven't seen yet, okay, if you think about all the possible ways to combine features of a programming language. So the key is to understand every single concept thoroughly so that when those features are combined, you don't have a problem understanding the combination. Has, have you guys been talk, have you guys talked about how to initialize an array or you know structure like this? No? Yes? Okay, I see some some I see some of this and some of this. So I guess it depends on the instructor. Um, but these are important things to actually understand too. They're, they're really crucial to understanding programming. All right, so do we have any questions regarding the C code? Shall we move on to the assembly code? Okay, so I'm gonna try to make the assembly code as close as possible to the C code. So let's go ahead and do that. So typically I start with a no op LDI uh, D0 to initialize the stack corner. Um, LDI A.6 plus, which is the return address of a call to main. Decrement D STDA is to push the return address on the stack. JMPI main is the last step to call main from the entry code. Yes? Sorry? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So don't you know, don't worry about your copying the program. You just kind of focus on the concept. Um, and then when it comes back, there's nothing else to do. So therefore a halt. Okay. So this is the entry code of the entire program. Now we need to define the structure node. So the way I define it is node underscore next, which is um, node refers to the name of the structure. Next refers to the member of the node of the structure. And this is the offset from the beginning of a structure of struct, uh, the beginning of a struct node to the beginning of the member next. And that should be a zero because it is the first member of the structure. And then the next item is value, and value is the next item. So it would be uh, node next one plus, or plus one, because node next is referring to the offset from the beginning of the structure to the member next. But because the member next only consumes one byte in assembly, and therefore there's a one here, and then the one plus means, you know, okay, this is where we can find the offset to the member value of a struct node. Is that okay so far? Okay. So this part is something that we talked about on Tuesday. You know, it's a different structure, but basically the same idea of how we name these labels. And then the next, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this is where the C code and the assembly code will be quite different because in the assembly code, in the C code, each struct node would use 16 bytes. And that's how the compiler works because it, it does not want anything to be crossing the boundary of an 8-byte boundary. But in assembly code, we have a very small RAM, which is only byte addressable. So every time the processor asks, hey, give me the content at that location, it's always coming back with only one byte. 
So we don't need to make it unnecessarily long in order to optimize your memory access. But in the case of a 64-bit processor, every time you ask for the content, you're always getting eight bytes back. And, you know, and as a result, it makes sense for things to be lined up at eight byte boundaries, because otherwise you can end up with needing two memory access to get eight bytes back, which is unnecessary and much slower. That is correct. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So now we can define array itself. So the way the array is defined is surprisingly he easy here because there's no structure in assembly language programming. So the only thing we now need to do, need to do is to say, okay, where do we find the beginning of the second element of array? Oh, I think we can find it at array array size one times plus. Whew. Okay, that's RPN right there. And I was, I, I came up with this expression even without thinking about it, but then I remember I need to explain it because you, know, you guys are all new to RPN. Okay, so how does this work? So we have array and then we have array size one. So kind of imagine that you push this, you push this, and then you push this. There are three items on the stack, okay, by the time you encounter the asterisk symbol. The asterisk symbol is telling the assembler, and go like, okay, we are going to perform a multiplication, and I need two things, two values to perform multiplication. So what the assembler is going to do is like, okay, let me check that's the value stack. This stack has nothing to do with the stack that we talk about normally. So it will check the value stack and will say, okay, I, I got one item here and I got the other item here. So it will pop array size one. Okay, okay I, let, me, let me do it in the right order. It will pop the one, it will pop array size as two separate values. And then it will perform a multiplication and then it will push the product back on the stack. Is that okay? So once the asterisk is processed, then we would have two values left on the value stack, which is array and the product between array size and one. Then we encounter the plus operator, and then at that point, the assembler is going like, okay, I'm going to perform an addition, but I need two values to, to perform the addition. And it will go check the value stack, and then at that point, it will find Array size times one is the first item it will pop, and then array itself is the second item it will pop. And those two items will now be used for the addition operation, and then after the addition operation, the sum is gonna be pushed on the stack. But at that point, I'm out of things to process, and that becomes the value of the expression. Yes? It will be the same as array plus array size times one, yes. Yep, which is where we're gonna find the second item in the array. Yep. Because I am doing a mechanical translation. If there's a one here, I'm putting that one over here. Because I'm doing a very mechanical way to translate it. All right, so the next item is simply the value six. And now we have array, array size, oops, <clears throat> two times plus. So this is why, because you know, I want this code here on line 14 and line 16 to correspond to line 11 and line 12. If I see a one here, I stash a one here. If I see a two here, I stash a two over here. So this way, there's a pattern, okay? And there's a reason you know, behind that pattern because the number of elements that you need to look ahead is the uh, multiplier to array size. And I, I think I got it wrong too, it's not array size, it's supposed to be node size, exactly. So I eh, made a mistake here. The assembler would actually catch this one because array size is not defined, so it would actually catch you know, this mistake. There we go. And this is a nine. And then the last one is going to have a null pointer followed by a value of two. 
So this, these six lines, from line 14 to line 19 of the assembly code, is implementing lines 10 to 14 in the C code. This is how we create an initialized array that is a global variable. This is not on the stack. This is just, you know, stashed somewhere along where the code is located, okay? So are we doing okay so far with this? Yes? On line 18, this is a zero as in a zero. This is not saying the, the address of array bracket zero. This is actually literally a zero. So that's why we don't use this format. Because otherwise, we'll be calculating the address of the first element in the array, which is not what the C code is, is getting. So it has to be an actual zero. Yep. It doesn't even have to be like that, because uh, the assembler is capable of resolving the values of labels. As long as it's not a circular reference, it will, it will resolve it. Yeah, that, that part actually took me a little bit of work to do. <laughs> All right. Do we have any questions at this point? Nope. OK. All right. <clears throat> so now we get to main, okay, so here's main, and I'm going to do a few things, you know, because the first thing I do is to do the return code. Uh, this is just your know, personal preference, because I tend to forget. So think of this as, you know, when I, when I see an open parenthesis, I automatically close first before I go back and backfill whatever is supposed to be going between the open and the closed parentheses, because I tend to forget the closed parentheses. So this is just my style of programming, which may or may not work for you guys. But we have local variables. In fact, we got two local variables. So now we have to say, okay, let's define some labels for those local variables. So we have P as a local variable. We have some also as a local variable. So after we do all the allocation, this is going to be at offset zero from where the stack pointer points to. So this is where we actually get to see the difference between a local variable as opposed to a global variable. Array is a global variable, and the way we allocate space and define the label representing array is pretty straightforward, okay? It is just a label and say, hey, this byte right here, the address of that byte is what the label is referencing. Because global variables is static in the sense that they're always at the same place and they always exist. The lifespan of a global variable is from the beginning of the execution of the entire program all the way to the termination of the entire program. In other words, it always, it's always there. And that even applies to static local variables. In other words, for local variables that are within a function, you can still say static. So if you have a static local variable, it still has the same lifespan as a global variable. It always exists. The only question is, where can you see that local variable? Is that okay? So technically speaking, when we refer to a local variable, we're only re referencing the scope of the variable, which basically means where in this entire program do I have visibility of this particular local variable, but not so much when does it start to exist and when does it cease to exist. So the lifespan versus the scope are two different questions. Yes? So in this case, it is a local variable, but at the same time, it is by default an auto-local variable. So there are two types of local variables. If you don't say anything, like the one that we have here, like all the other programs that we have done in this class, the assumption or the default is auto, A-U-T-O, which means it is automatically allocated 
only when you need it, only when the function is called. So those are all on the stack. If you add the keyword static before struct node or before your know, uint eight underscore t, then it becomes a static local variable. Then it has the same lifespan as array, but the visibility in C is limited to only within the, the main function. It was, it's still local. Yeah, so both of these are auto local variables. There are very few cases where you really need to have static local variables. Most of the time, you know, you really just want the usual, which is the auto local variable, which is on the stack. For many reasons. Recursion is one, but that's not the only reason. All right, so sum is the next item. So we have main p. And then the size of p is just one byte because it is a pointer to a structure. So it only takes a one byte in TTP and then the plus. And those are the only two local variables that we need. So the LVS, the local variable size of main, is just main underscore sum one plus because you know, the sum itself is also just taking one byte. So this is how I make use of labels in order to remember where I can find the local variable, as well as you know, how many local variables, how many bytes do I, do I need to allocate for all the local variables. So this way, I can have a template in my, in my head and just go like, okay, I just need to allocate and then deallocate. I need to allocate at the beginning of the function and deallocate at the end of the function. And then in between those chunks of code, I would have the variables existing. So this is nothing new, okay? So I'm pretty sure you guys know this code already, uh, main underscore LVS, and then we subtract this much from the stack pointer to do the allocation, and then we add it back in order to deallocate the local variables. So that means, you know, use in the context of our earlier discussion, we can now say p and sum start to exist here. It is after we adjust the stack pointer, so they have the space to exist. They're not initialized, but they have a space, and therefore they start to exist. Yes? It's more like subtracting the, uh, the two, which is LVS, is decrementing the stack pointer by two is the allocation, and then incrementing the stack pointer by two is the opposite, which is to deallocate. Just remember, everything that is below where the stack pointer points to, you have gremlins going over and you know, messing th mess, mess things up. So we want to kind of put that magical barrier <laughs> a little bit over first and go like, okay, now you guys cannot mess around with stuff on this side. And then we can start to use that space for something that, you know, that we need for the program. Because if you start to use the space before you move that magical barrier, then you can put something over there, and then the next moment, it's not there anymore. Because guess what? The gremlins just ate it. Yes? Um, yes, technically, yes. <laughs> So you are correct. That can be done here. <laughs> but nobody is here to interpret the return code of main in this case. But you're correct. If I were to write this code to mirror the C code 100%, that is needed. OK, very good. All right. So. Now that we have p and sum starting to exist here, we can now start to do stuff with it, right? So we're going to go implement line 20 of the C code over here. And at this point, um, I think all of you should be somewhat familiar with this kind of template of code because we started to talk about local variables and parameters, that sort of thing, I believe last Thursday or maybe even earlier. I think it's last Thursday. All right, so I'm just going to make this quick. Uh, so this is the constant of zero, and then we just need to calculate the address of sum. So that would be offset 
address, and now we can do a store. There we go. So that's uh, line 20 of the C code. Now we can deal with uh, line 21. So line 21, you know, when you look at the C code uh, on the left, on the right hand side, it looks awfully complicated, right? If we are looking at the address of the first element of array. But in assembly code, that is actually no more complicated than the previous line. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we calculate the left-hand side. So we have array. So one thing you might notice is array doesn't have main underscore as a prefix because it is a global variable. There's no function prefix to basically say, ah, this is a local variable of that function. No, it doesn't belong to any function. It's a global variable, which is also an address. So this will actually suffice, but I'm going to do something that is unnecessary, but it is helpful, okay? Which is to go through the motion of the multiplication by zero, okay? So this part, okay, node size zero times and then the plus does absolutely nothing because in the end, what we are doing is we compute zero times node size, which is zero, and then add that zero to array, which is just array itself. So it doesn't do a single thing, but it makes it mirror the C code perfectly and explain how we compute the address of a specific element in an array. Yes? Yes. I mean, this part of the class is basically turning all of you into organic compilers. <laughs> Which is very helpful because you know, when you get into higher level programming classes, uh, sometimes you would encounter symptoms of a program that you cannot otherwise explain unless you understand what is on the stack, how things are computed, and so on and so forth. So this is actually helpful if you will, will continue to write programs in C or C++. It is absolutely useless if you're going to program in JavaScript or Python from here on. Okay, I don't see any reaction from you guys. You guys must be tired. Yes, go ahead. Thirty-one and thirty-three. You mean here? This is the offset of sum. It's the offset of sum from where the stack pointer points to. By adding the stack pointer to the offset, now I have the actual address of sum, at which point I can store to that location. So this is something that we looked at last Thursday, the first time. Uh, but we also you know, use similar um, patterns of code on Tuesday. So you know, that means you know, reviewing those other programs can be helpful as well. All right, so now we just need to figure out where P is, okay? I think by this time you guys will go like, oh, okay, so we, I see the pattern, okay? Now, noticing the pattern is good, but noticing the pattern without understanding the pattern may not be very productive. So that means you, know, you really need to know why this pattern gets things done. Because you can see line 21 translates to a particular pattern. Line 21, excuse me, line 20 you know, translates to one pattern. Line 21 translates to a pattern that looks almost exactly the same when it comes to the use of instructions and registers and so on and so forth. But you have to understand why that is the case, okay? So that why, is really important. All right, so next we have a, a loop, okay? So line 22 is a loop. So now I am really testing whether you guys still remember how to translate a loop into assembly language. I believe we talked about that oh, a long time ago. We'll just say a long time ago, okay? <clears throat> All right, so what do we do with a loop, with a while loop? Well, the first thing is I think we need to remember where it starts, okay? So we are gonna have a label to say, this is where it starts. 
And if you want to prepare for multiple while loops, you know, in the same function, you can always number the while loop too. It's totally unnecessary in this case because we only have one while loop. But I'm going to do it this way, okay? And I already know I need an and label. In other words, one label says, hey, go back here if you need another iteration. Another label says, hey, if it's time to get out of the, of the, of the loop, go over here. So I know these two labels are required. One acts as the open parenthesis, the other one acts as the end close parenthesis. So I always write code in a structured way. I don't care what is in the loop, I'm going to write the structure of the loop first. I also know before we get to the end label, I need a unconditional branch back to the beginning because that is how while loops operate is um, at the end of each iteration, you have to go all the way back to the beginning and then evaluate the condition again. So this is a very basic structure of a while loop. Every while loop should have a start label, an end label, and an unconditional branch to go back to the beginning. They should all be there. Is that, yep. Uh, oh, that's just typo. Just me messing up, yep. Should be a zero. And it's not even needed, you know, because there's only one while loop in the entire thing. The, the digit is here just in case I have multiple loops and I can identify which loop we are talking about. All right, so the first thing we need to do in the loop is to evaluate the expression, just P, and say, is it a zero or a non-zero? Because if it is a zero, it's time to get out. If it's a non-zero, then don't get out and continue with the body of the loop. All right, so that means I need access to P. So once again, this is a pattern, offset, address, and this time I need the value because I'm not checking whether the address of P is null or not. I'm checking whether the value of P is null or not. So that means I need an LD instruction, okay? And then do and AA so that you know, the uh, the value of register A is forced through the ALU and therefore affecting the flags. And the only you know, instruction I can really use here is JZI. Um, and JZI is branching if it is zero, which in this case is handy because I do want to branch to the end of the loop when P is zero. So that means, ah, okay, handy. Sometimes it's not handy. But this time, yeah, it's perfectly what I need. So now I have the structure of the loop entirely written, and now I can focus on the content of the loop, which consists of these two statements. So I'm going to pause a little bit here. You guys can kind of write your notes, catch up a little bit, ask questions. Go ahead. Forces it through the ALU. And anything that goes through the ALU will set the flags, at least it will set the sign flag and the Z flag. This is the very same trick that we did uh, in, I think, the absolute value program, you know, which is one of the labs. Okay. All right. So that means you know, this is a good reminder that the labs are actually material for you to study as well. There are, a, there are some content that is useful. It's not so much you know, what AND does, but an application of AND it is, it's talked about in the lab. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions before we proceed to implement line 24 and line 25 of the C code? We have the skeleton or the overall structure of the while loop done. We now you know, just need to go implement line 24 and line 25. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. All right, line 24, okay? You know, this is, in, this is a little bit more complicated because you have to pronounce, you have to say the right-hand side in the right way in order to have a chance to implement it correctly. So the right-hand side of line 24 is the value of the member value of the structure, 
that is pointed to by local variable p. Is that long? Yes. Is it unnecessarily long? No. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say that one more time. Okay. The right hand side of line 24 is the value as opposed as opposed to the address of. It is the value of the member called value of the structure that is pointed to by the local variable p. Okay, so if I were to tell this to a middle schooler, okay, and who has absolutely no experience in programming whatsoever, and I ask, so what do you think I need first? Do you think that middle schooler would be able to say, ah, okay, I, from what you just told me, I think we need to get to this first. What do we need to get to first? Okay, do, 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 yeah, go ahead. We need P first, right? We need, we need P because all of those, the entire phrase says we need the value of the member value of the structure that is pointed to by P. So all those of OF and all and the by, you know, basically give you an idea of, oh, okay, so I can't get to that until I get this one first. I cannot get to that until I get this first. So that means the very first thing I need to get to is P. The sequencing of what you need in order to get the entire chain to work is the key to answer that question. Is that okay? And that is why when I refer to this, the value of the right-hand side, I don't just say P points to value because that doesn't tell me anything. But if I expel it out like the way I did, then it would go like, oh, okay, so now I know the dependency of what I need first, then what I need, and then what I need, and so on. Okay, so let's start with, uh, P, okay, so I need to get to at least the address of P, okay? So let's go ahead and get to P first, okay? Now I have the address of P. Well, knowing the address of P is not enough because the address of P doesn't tell me what P is pointing to because the value of P itself is the pointer, okay? Is the address of the structure. So that means I need to get to the address of the structure. Now A is the address of the structure of which a certain member I need to get to. Is that okay? So once again, I am not putting my comment here because I want you to kind of put in your own comments. But I will just kind of verbally say that on line 49, register A has the address of the structure of which a certain member I need, I need okay? So now I go like, okay, um, in order to get to a member, the only thing I know is the offset of the member from the beginning of the structure. That is known as node underscore uh, value in this case, okay? That might be useful. Right, let me put it into a register. Okay, so what do I have at this point? A is the address of a structure, B, is the offset between the offset from the beginning of a structure to the member called value. Hmm, I think between these two, I can figure out the address of the member called the value. And how would I do that? Just add them together, okay? Now, which way you want to add is entirely up to you in this case, because you have neither register A or B has any particular significance at this point unless you want to do some optimization. So do you guys want me to see, do, do you want to see me do some optimization or do you just go like, no, no, just make it as straightforward as possible. You can vote. <laughs> you want to see optimization? I see a few nods, yes? Okay, so we'll do the optimization, okay? So if I do the optimization, I'm gonna use register B, I would destroy register B in the process, okay? So I do LD B, oh, add first, okay, sorry, add B A. So A is preserved, but B is destroyed. So now B is the address 
of the member value of the structure that P is pointing to. Okay. And, well, great. But I don't need the, va the address of the member value. I need the value of the value. So, eh, okay, that's just yeah, one more the reference. So now register B is the right-hand side. I need to add it to sum. So that means I need to get to sum. I want to preserve A as if I can. Okay, so I'm going to try to preserve A. So that means I only have one register left that I can use, which is register C. So register C is this. Now I get to the address of that. Ah. Unfortunately, I cannot uh, do the optimization <laughs> not entirely because I ran out of registers. Okay, because at this point, register C is the address of sum, which is great. But in order to add something to sum, I need to get to the current value of sum as well. So how many things do I need to maintain? Okay, I technically don't need to maintain the address. I can always quote unquote recompute it. That's okay. I'll do it in the cumbersome way and just recompute it. Okay, LDCC. So now the C is the actual value of sum. I need to add to it whatever is in B. So add uh, CB. Now where do I store it back? Because I'm supposed to. Um, this is a plus equal, which means I'm supposed to change some. I have lost track of some already. So that means I have to recompute the address of some to store register C back into that address. Register B is available right now. So I can do that whole thing. There we go. But register A is saved. Currently, okay, I have not messed up, you know, messed up register A yet. So this is all done, okay. Um, by the time we get to line 60, uh, line 24 of the C code is done. So now I move on to line 25. So line 25 is very much like line 24 from the structure perspective. We're trying to access the value of a member of a structure that is pointed to by P. And this time, it's just a straight you know, assignment to whatever is on the left-hand side. OK, but I still have register A retaining the address of the structure that I want to change, that I want to access. Sorry, I want to access. So that means these three lines of code, I don't have to do any more. I just have to say, hmm, the offset is node underscore next, and just have to add that to register A. So. Now I can just put that offset into a register, and then I can use add A, B, or B, A. It doesn't matter this time which way. So now register B becomes the address of the member next of the structure that P is pointing to. Okay, So it's not really that much of an optimization, because you know, if I don't save it and just recompute it, I would not have saved any you know, clock cycles. I mean, this really is not a save. But you know, this way you, know, you kind of get some experience of, oh, so I need to track what is in a particular register so that when later on, if I refer to that you know, register, you would know what is in that register. That is what you need to do for the final exam, okay? Because the final exam would consist of code kind of like this, okay? Where you kind of need to track what each register has in the context of the C code. So the, by the time I reference a register, you would know, oh, I know what is in that register. I know what this instruction is going to do. Okay, so that is important. All right, so register B has the address of the member next of the structure that P is pointing to. I need a D reference to get to the actual value of the member next. And now I can use it to change whatever P has. So I cannot just you know, do a STA, ST uh, parentheses A, because A is pointing to whatever P is pointing to. But I want to change P this time. So I cannot just do it. In other words, this would be the wrong thing to do. OK, don't do that. So I need to do the entire thing, OK, which is a little bit cumbersome. But given the architecture that we have, you know, this is a uh, Kind of 
what we have to do main underscore p add a d s t now we can do the store all right so line 62 to line 67 is accomplishing line 25 of the c code but it's, it's shorter only because I preserve register A after line 49 of the assembly code. I did not change that register A. Register A continues to store um, the pointer pointing to the structure that I need to access. Is that okay so far? So I have to recompute a lot of things, okay? As you might notice, there are a few, quite a few registers here that have basically the same thing, but since I ran out of registers, I have to kind of reuse those things. The reason why I have to do this is because I only have four registers, okay, which is a very small number of registers. Most modern architectures have a much larger number of registers. They range from 16 to 32 to even more. So that means the more registers I have, then I can kind of go like, okay, register, you know, blah, blah. I just want you to maintain that particular value because I know I need it back later. So I don't have to recompute things and then overwrite the register and then recompute again, okay? So the more register, the better because the compiler can keep track of which register have, has what much better than a person. So it can make use of those multiple registers and optimize you know, these you know, calculations so that we don't have to recompute things over and over again. But with only four registers, I kind of don't have a choice. All right, so I think this program is done. Um, we'll go ahead and run it and see what happens. So we'll go to um, Reefer Spider. So let's go to, yeah. Did I? Uh, I believe so. Let me get here first, and then I'll check that. Okay. The halt is right here on line seven. All right, so the moment of truth. I'm hoping the program doesn't work so I can actually show you how to debug a program. You, you might think that I'm kidding, but I'm actually not kidding. Because I think debugging is, is a technique that is not taught, but it really should have been taught in classes starting with at least CISP 360. And why do you think that is the case? Yep, because in, in real life, you'll be spending more time to do debugging than you're actually writing new code. In fact, you know, the first programming job that you do as an entry level you know, software engineer or a programmer, you will probably be fixing code and more so than writing new code. Um, because there's nothing that can help you understand the code base more than just taking the bug reports and try to figure out why there's a bug, why the program is misbehaving. Because it doesn't involve you know, inventing anything new, it does not in, you know, involve, oh, let's do something new, but it does involve understanding the existing code really well. So that's usually what um, entry level positions do is to kind of fix bugs. All right, so it's all done, okay? This is the entire trace, <coughs> excuse me. So what I'll do is I'm going to shortcut this whole thing. I just want to see whether the program terminates correctly. So we, we get all the way to the end. It did get to the halt instruction. The stack pointer went back to zero. So from that perspective, the program is not terribly wrong, okay? Because there's wrong and there's terribly wrong. This program cannot be terribly wrong if it you know, got this part done right. So the other clue that I want to know is um, where is sum? You know, where is that supposed to be, and how do we uh, verify that sum is in fact you know um, changed correctly? Um, I don't have the tablet enabled right now, so I'm going to use a text box or text editor to do this. Okay, 
it will do just fine. You know, it's not a it's not a huge deal. There we go. Uh, no. Okay, there we go. All right. So these are the locations on the stack. F C F B. I don't think we need that many. We are not even calling any other thing. You know, so main is the only uh, function being called. All right. So we know this location is the return address to the entry point code. Okay. So it has no particular name. So we just call entry point. And then these two locations are going to be my local variables. The first local variable is, um, which one is it? Which one did I use as the first one? Sorry? I have to, yeah. So this will tell me P is the first one. So P is at the lower location. Uh, P is at the lower location. Sum is at the next location. So we go back here. This is uh, local variable P. This is local variable sum. So that means location FE should be updated to the sum of the three values, which we added up to be what, 17, I think? So it's 17 in decimal, which is uh, what in hexadecimal? One, one, because one times 16 plus one. Okay, so this is you know, in hexadecimal, it should be one, one. So one quick way to see if the program worked correctly is to go back and look at the memory update and see whether location FE eventually is updated to um, that content. Yep, that, that's it. So this is, I mean, I probably can check a little bit closer, but I think it's fairly conclusive that the program is working correctly. Shucks, because I was hoping that it wouldn't work correctly. Then I can show you, okay, so now what do we do? Okay, you know, because the way you debug a program, because you're gonna have to do it with your homework assignment, the way you debug a program is to start at the very beginning. There's no quick and easy way to do this, except to start from the very beginning, and then you just go line by line and ask, is the effect of the instruction, which is gonna be logged by columns B, C, D, and E, the way you expect it? Which also means you, know, you need to know what the program is supposed to do to begin with, so that you can detect that, oh, okay, it's deviating from what I thought it should be doing, and then you basically stop right there, and then you know, start to kind of look at your code and analyze, why is it doing this when it's not supposed to be doing that? Which also tells me, you know, reminds me, to talk about you know, how you write code at this point. I know we only got one week left, okay? But the program that you're gonna write in this one week is not the kind of program where you go like, Okay, I'm gonna be like tech. I'm gonna write the entire thing and I'll run it and it's gonna run beautifully and correctly and I'll be done with this homework assignment. That is not going to happen. <laughs> okay, so what is more likely to happen is you would kind of throw, I mean, I can throw in stupid bugs, okay? That would take me a little bit of time to find too, okay? So you're more than more likely than not, you're gonna have some bugs. So the the, the the way to approach these programs is to write a little bit of code, put a halt instruction right in the middle of the function that you're writing so that the program would actually stop there. And then you check everything up to that point. If everything is as expected up to that point, then you continue with that program. But on the other hand, if by the, halt, by the time it gets to the halt instruction or it does not even get to the halt instruction, then go like, maybe I should fix something first. This is also where you know, um, knowing how to use get, you know, the command line program, or GitHub, if you want to use the website, is going to be helpful. Because every time you say, okay, I'm just, my target is to get it working up to this point. And you did get it up to that point, it's time to check it into the repository. Because this way, if you make some further changes after a few years, and then the program just completely doesn't work anymore, they go like, what did I change in this program to make it worse than before? And I cannot remember a single thing because it's after a few beers, right? And then what do you do? 
All you have to do is to go to GitHub and compare your current version of the program to whatever you checked in earlier. So you can find all the changes. It may be just one line that you changed that is not supposed to happen that's causing all of those problems. But being able to visually do a div or you know, looking at the differences between what you have at this point versus the last time you checked in to get is really helpful because then you can go like, okay, it can only be these lines that I changed you know, between when I, after a few, I had a few beers, okay? So you don't have to look through the entire program all over again to find those bugs. So you have to write programs in smaller steps at this point. All right, so we are at the end of the lecture. I wish the semester is a few weeks longer. I know you guys are already going like, no. <laughs> but I hope the semester is a few weeks longer so I can actually talk more about these things. So tonight's lab is called Structures and Pointers, which is exactly what we did, okay? Structures and Pointers. And it only, it's only worth three points, so it's not really a lot of points here, but it does contain instructions, so I would do it kind of like slowly and carefully. Let me uh, get to reset the... Show correct answer, 8.20 p.m. And the access code is not even required. So you guys can all go in as soon as you get to the lab. But there's a companion assignment you know, that you also have to do. So you know, just kind of keep that in mind. Yep, I wish the semester is a little bit longer. <laughs> hmm? I think so. I really you know, have quite a bit more material that I, I can talk about. <laughs> All right, see you at the lab. Yeah, this one won't take long. It's the programming part that is going to take a long time. Uh, we have the other one that is also, quote, unquote, a homework. So this one is due on Monday. Yeah, and then tonight has another one, which is going to do, is due on, is it the 9th or the 8th? Let me see. Today is the second plus seven. It is the ninth. So the other one should be due on the seventh then. Okay, I got it, bro. That was me. That was my bad. Okay. All right. Yep. <laughs>